Hey, everybody here, Mark Moisier, uh, California attorney. And over this last weekend, I had so many different requests from people on social media asking me to look into the Riverside County public health officers order mandating that people wear masks. And people were saying, is this legal? Is this constitutional? Uh, and I had so many of you ask me about the issue that I went ahead and put everything aside today and dug into this issue. And I wanted to walk you through this in a way like a lawyer it would be doing. If, you, if a client came in, brought a case, uh, it's not easy to just answer, is something constitutional or not? It doesn't, you, you don't just go pull out and say, ah, that's the answer and good. Um, two weeks ago, I did a, uh, a presentation on whether it was legal to have the shelter in place rules. And I probably spent 40, 50 hours researching it. So um, those videos were very well documented uh, of what I saw, what I, you know, and why I came to the conclusion that it is actually unconstitutional. Now, before we get into this particular issue about whether a government uh, should be able to mandate a uh, that you wear a mask or not. I do want to remind you that, you know, these are my opinions based upon looking through statute code constitutional. And please be advised that this is not <laughs> legal advice for your particular situation. Um, and there can be consequences um, if you go out and you, because you feel like uh, the quarantine is violates your constitutional rights. You may be arrested and you may have to uh, pay attorney fees to try to get out of that. So uh, please take what I say and remember, you know, there may not be a law that prohibits a storm chaser from chasing a storm. The government may use its uh, bully pulpit and recommend that you don't do that. But at the end of the day, there is some freedom that we allow Americans to choose what to do and what not to do. You know, I'm, you know, I'm generally staying at home most of the time. I'm not taking unnecessary stuff. But what we're doing here is we're talking about what the government is doing. So let's dig into this uh, and let's try to do somewhat uh, sequentially as we as we walk through this process. So the first question really comes up to, does the government have the authority to regulate you do something for your own safety? And we see, you know, people might argue, hey, the government regulates the speed that you can drive your car. Okay, there's speed limits. For truckers, there's how many hours they're allowed to drive their car over the course of a week or a day. But, you know, there are other questions along this line, you know, when it comes to safety issues. Let's think about smoking. Technically, you don't have a constitutional right to smoke, but government hasn't banned it completely. They may have you know, you can't do it in a public building. You can't do it within 25 feet of a public building. And it's well documented what the health hazards are of smoking. But, you know, as a you know government, they haven't told you, no, you can't smoke. There, there seems to be a little prerogative here. And so the question is, why all of a sudden is Riverside County saying everybody must wear a mask? And you know, there, there is a little bit of concern here because the thing is, it's the legislature who has decided not to ban smoking. It is the legislature who sets these rules on what speeding limits are. It's not public health officials. I mean, if I asked you guys a month ago, do you, do you know that Riverside County had a public health official who in the state of emergency could mandate that everybody wear masks? Nobody knew of this position of the government. Uh, health officer, and nobody realized the power that these individuals had. So, you know, let's stop and think about this for a second. The legislature has not banned sugar from the planet Earth just because some people might get diabetes or some people, you know, may cause higher health premiums. 
So why, in the name of safety, all of a sudden, is a public health official, an unelected individual, able to mandate that you wear a mask? And that there's some serious concerns that I have about the amount of authority we are giving these unelected officials in the state of emergency. I mean, I have seen peer-reviewed articles that indicate that wearing masks don't have much of an impact. And all of a sudden, now we're supposed to believe non-peer-reviewed articles that are coming out as fast as we want that maybe we have to wear masks. I'm concerned about the implications of that. But, you know, as a citizen, I should be able to research it. And we shouldn't have one individual who nobody knew even existed all of a sudden being able to be king emperor of Riverside County mandating what people can do or can't do. So the question really starts coming down to one of authority. Does the public health official have this authority? And, you know, I, I took the order by the public health official and I looked up every single, you know, code section that they said give them, gave them the power to do this. And I actually found it quite funny because several of the code sections have absolutely nothing to do with a public health official's ability to declare a state of emergency. Some of them dealt with very localized things like a, you know, hazmat spill, but somehow because of a hazmat skill, it spill gives public health officials certain authority, that authority now applies into this case. And so there's some really weak legal arguments that I saw throughout this whole thing. Uh, so, one of the big concerns that I have here is that this local, the, the purpose of a local emergency is to deal with a local situation where the local entity needs outside assistance to help them with. Let's give you a case in point, something that we can all understand. If there is a forest fire in Riverside County, they declare a state of emergency or of a local emergency so that Los Angeles County can send firefighters into Riverside County to help terminate it. And so the question I really have here is does a local, when, when we have a state of emergency statewide that everybody is suffering from, does a local county really have the authority to issue an order mandating everybody wear masks when Riverside County cannot show that they really have a problem that's worse than anywhere else? And so that's, that's one of the questions that I would have. And if, if a client came to me and said, Mark, I want to challenge this Riverside uh, ordinance, this is probably one of the areas that I would end up challenging it under, is that we are under a state of emergency and the local emergency uh, should not supersede the state of emergency. We should have one policy na uh, statewide. We don't need to have every little county and every little city having their own little turf battles of what some unelected official uh, says what the rules should be for that area. And that is one of the biggest problems that I've been seeing out of the state of emergency is how all these various government officials seem to want to add their – impose their own special orders. And this Riverside one is probably one of the worst because of what it actually says. Speaking of what it actually says, let's read this paragraph because it does create some major problems for me. All persons, including essential workers – shall wear face coverings, such as scarves, bandanas, neck gaiters, or other fabric face coverings. All persons, including essential workers, are discouraged from using personal protective equipment, such as an N95 mask, for non-medical reasons. Okay, this law says that you, who are watching this video right now, in your home, and nobody else in your home, you need to be wearing a mask right this second if you're in Riverside County. This law appears to be so overly broad 
because it applies to you in your home. It applies to you in your car, not just in the grocery store, not just when you're around other people, but it, 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 there are no exceptions. This is not narrowly tailored. And if there was a challenge to this on the, on the fact that it, because of how broad it is, it actually violates some of your constitutional rights, the courts might strike it down, might strike it down in its entirety, entirety <clears throat> or may actually try to narrow it up on its own. How does that work? Well, let's look at some of the issues. Um, there's a First Amendment free speech. Now, we see this in the area of condom uses. And the Supreme Court has held that, you know what, people have a right of privacy. The state government cannot mandate that you uh, can't use a condom. But in other cases, they have upheld regulations that the porn industry must wear a condom. Uh, sometimes I don't understand courts, how they can have such a dichotomy, uh, but they, they have they have found that, you know, in your own home, there's a right of privacy and that privacy allows, uh, you know, a heightened level strict scrutiny. But in the porn industry, you know, where Los Angeles County passed a uh, law, an ordinance that said that, you know, porn stars had to wear a condom, that was actually upheld in the courts because the government had an important interest of protecting against STDs. That's how the courts have interpreted it. But, you know, how that applies in this particular case is, you know, the government is basically saying all persons shall wear a face mask. And basically that appears that you need to be wearing a face mask when you sleep, when you're in bed. Uh, you need to wear a face mask when you're in your car, whether you're with a family or with with your with complete strangers. Um, so. This statute really does appear to be overly broad. It does appear to start coming into some privacy areas that are laid out by the First Amendment. Um, so, you know, where does this all go to? You know, several people have laid out that, wait a second, this is an unfunded mandate. You have a public health official mandating that people go out and buy masks or, you know, create masks. And this is an unfunded mandate. But we do know that the government does have the authority to uh, require everybody to p purchase insurance. And we saw that in the Obamacare uh, cases, although that's now going up on the Supreme Court again to be decided. But, you know, the government does have some ability to mandate that you buy certain things. So that in and of itself may not be a valid grounds for striking it down, but it does make it more unpopular. One of the inter interesting things that I've seen here is that, you know, actually this was not signed off by the county supervisors visors in Riverside. And it does appear like there is authority that if the, the emergency council is acting, that the county supervisors can actually stop it within seven days if they so choose. So there does appear to be an argument that the county supervisors of Riverside can actually rein in this overstepping uh, government official. And if you live in Riverside County and you think that the government shouldn't be mandating masks, I definitely encourage you to reach out to your county supervisors and say, I've elected you. I want you to do the right thing and not be mandating that I wear a mask 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, whether I'm home alone watching TV or whether I'm with my family eating dinner, you know, I guess you got to have a mask over your head and, you know, shove food up your uh, underside of the mask. Um, there's a lot of problems with this. And, you know, the biggest thing that I see in the whole is this whole problem is that you basically have an unelected government bureaucrat making laws that everybody has to obey whether or not the laws actually are useful or not you know it's there's no freedom of choice here there's you know there's it's, it's mandated and they're mandating it with one thousand uh, dollar fees in prison time and so there 
there are some concerns about this. So the question then also becomes, is this going to be preempted? You know, the state of California is regulating uh, this public health. Can counties um, do this? And they're, they're, I've seen legal authority on each going each direction. I have seen stuff like during the Rodney King riots where counties had individual curfews. And the argument was raised, wait a second, you know, why is a city allowed to have an individual curfew uh, when this is a, you know, a state of emergency? Shouldn't the state be regulating it? And the courts in that case found that no, uh, you know, the, the um, there was no preemption. However, during the AIDS epidemic, one county wanted to uh, pass an ordinance that they allowed them to give out free needles uh, to drug addicts in order to take to fight the AIDS epidemic. And the, you know, the attorney general of the state of California said, no, under the doctrine of preemption, because the state has declared it a state of emergency over the entire state, uh, this is not something that you're going to be allowed to do on a pick and choose basis. You know, this is going to be a statewide policy. So, you know, as an attorney, I would definitely be arguing towards the, you know, that this is a state of emergency. It's not a local emergency. And that, you know, the governor has not declared that everybody wear a mask. And as such, Riverside County probably should not be allowed to mandate that you wear a mask. Um, just looking over my notes here to make sure there's not anything else that we really should uh, discuss. Uh, really, I think I've discussed everything here. I, I think the jury is still out on to whether this is unconstitutional or not. If you live in Riverside County and you're interested in uh, pursuing legal action on this, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, the, the thing is that, you know, many people say, why hasn't there been more lawsuits yet? problem is when you're fighting, it's not like an automobile accident where there's an insurance policy and you have certain damages where attorneys can say, okay, I can take this case. I can hire a paralegal who shuffles papers around and moves the case forward. And I have limited expense and I have big payoffs in the end. A problem with these constitutional cases, and I've had this happen before. I fought for over a year on a case, spending hundreds of hours of my time and at the end of the day, the court said, agreed. My client was completely right. And oh, by the way, here's a judgment where you're going to get paid uh, three cents on every dollar. I don't care that you think that you're worth, you know, a couple hundred dollars an uh, hour. I'm only going to let you be paid at $20 an hour. And that's that's pretty hard for an attorney to say, OK, I'm going to go spend the next seven years of my life fighting this case all the way up to the Supreme Court that government officials did not have the ability to issue quarantines in the shelter in place or did not have the ability to mandate mask. Um, and so as such, it, there, there needs to be a partnership. You know, sometimes I, I liken it to the movie, The Magnificent Seven. You know, the villagers may not have had much, but they still took what they had to pay for the the men who came and rescued them from the bad guys. Uh, right now, we got public health officials who are trampling over our constitutional rights. And we want to make sure that the case that we bring is the right case. And we want to make sure that we're able to fight it all the way to, to try to slap down these government agencies and remind them that there is limits. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And just because there's a national emergency or a state of emergency does not give public health officials the authority to trample upon your constitutional rights. And so, you know, I'm spending multiple hours a day talking to potential clients. We're looking at what the, you know, the cost of such litigation could be, what the benefits are to the people who bring the lawsuits. But, you know, it, it's not as easy as a personal automobile accident where you have an accident, you can just run to the court and file for damages. Constitutional right issues are significantly harder issues and you need to make sure that you have the right plaintiff, the right set of facts, because what you don't want to do is lose a case because you do it, you know, just go and file a lawsuit and actually do more damage to the cause later on. Until next time, everybody, my name is Mark Moisier. 
I'm here to educate you and help you understand what your rights are and how they are being affected during this COVID-19. Talk to you later.